Okay, I'll just go ahead and talk. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, okay, so thanks so much, Rory. It's it's really nice to to be here with all of you. It's really nice to see you. Uh, in particular, um, normally we would at least see each other once a year with the AAG or something like that. Um, and yeah, and actually it's, it's just nice to see geographers for that reason, since there's no AAG. Um, I, I'll try to be sort of succinct uh, in, in talking today. Um, what I wanted to do was just share a little bit of some newer research and some new material that I've just written up. Um, uh, on a larger book project that I'm finishing about the city and the urban and the Anthropocene. Um, and this, this work has been funded by a, a really amazing grant from the Urban Studies Foundation, um, the Postdoctoral Research Fellowship. And it's been based in Miami uh, where I've been doing research for the past uh, several years. Um, so let me share my PowerPoint with you real quick. Um, I just have a couple images to, to go with my talk. Does that look good? Everyone sees it? Perfect. Okay, super. Um, this, so this, this, this work I've been doing about the city and the Anthropocene has been sort of uh, framed by two main problem areas, um, two main kind of problem questions uh, that I've been thinking about. Um, and I would like to just kind of lay those out first and then I'll go into some of this Miami uh, material that I've been working on. Um, the first is this idea that we see sort of repeatedly everywhere, ubiquitously, um, that the Anthropocene is and will be an urban age. So there are a lot of different versions of this idea, right? We have um, the classic kind of, you know, United Nations version um, that we see in a lot of academic work as well, um, that we're living in an age, an urban age, um, in which the majority of the world's population has now uh, is now living in cities. So this demographic uh, way of thinking about it. And then there's also the idea of planetary urbanization, um, which is, you know, you know, based with the, Neil, the work of Neil Brenner, uh, more of this idea that um, the, the, the whole planet, the earth is becoming increasingly enmeshed in um, uh, urbanized and urbanizing processes, um, operational landscapes being um, created to service urban agglomerations and so on. So this, this urban age idea uh, has different versions, um, but it is something that we see kind of repeatedly everywhere, and it's not often questioned. Um, we see, you know, a lot of work around the idea of how do you prepare cities for uh, the Anthropocene and the kind of upheavals that will come with it. So a lot of work around, especially uh, resilient cities, and that's that's the kind of research I've done for a pretty long time too. Um, but it seems sort of like the only question there is, you know whether, you know, how, how resilient or less resilient a city will be or urban spaces will be, um, you know, and, and for critics, the work then is often, you know, criticizing resilience, trying to, you know, pull apart some of its inequalities, its subjectivities, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but what's not questioned, again, is this idea of the Anthropocene as an urban age. Um, and so one question that I have been thinking about quite a bit is this, you know, is, is this necessarily so? Will the Anthropocene, you know, uh, be inherently an urban age? Will the 21st century actually see urban spaces and processes, you know, surviving uh, the upheavals of the Anthropocene, whether we understand that to mean um, climate change and its effects or human adaptive responses to climate change and, and other um, upheavals? Uh, so will the urban as we know it survive and will it define the Anthropocene? So that's the first kind of opening question. Um, the second sort of problem question that I that I am thinking about quite a bit um, is uh, tied to Neil Brenner's work on planetary urbanization. Um, I have been reading uh, all of it and I love it and I'm a huge admirer of, of his work. Um, you know, and, and he's, his work and the idea of planetary urbanization is pretty well known. It's, you know, it's generated a lot of controversy and debate um, and in, ge in geography and urban studies. Um, but what, what, I, what I actually think is um, really compelling uh, and, and interesting uh, is his sort of foundational um, challenge to urban studies that kind of um, undergirds then the, the, the later work on planetary urbanization, which is this idea, uh, Brenner's idea, that um, urban studies for too long has relied on inherited spatial categories. Um, so by this, he's talking specifically about the idea of the bounded city, uh, the city as this discrete bounded place, um, and you know, 
and what he what he argues uh, is that you know, and of course, there's a lot of debate and controversy around this argument. But but what he argues is you know um, that this spatial concept is something that uh, urban theorists have inherited from the the 19th and early 20th century, you know, it, from the specific historical moment, right? That is now being superseded by later processes of capitalist globalization and accumulation and so on, right? So, so what Brenner argues is, you know, uh, urban theorists need to, you know, uh, be in the present and, you know, analyze and, and, and think with the, the emergent spatial forms and processes and mutations that are being thrown up um, in the, the 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 late 20th and then 21st century, so he's you know urban studies needs to be contemporary is kind of his argument, and I find that to be a really interesting argument. Um, more broadly speaking, even if we step back and think about the Anthropocene and the need to potentially um, you know uh, be aware of the, the the novel formations that are emerging in 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 our unique historical context, rather than importing old frameworks. So so I'm sympathetic sympathetic to that. Um, but what I what I have noticed in reading all the, the planetary urbanization work is that there is a lot less um, thought and research being done on um, the sort of the mutations that the Anthropocene uh, is giving rise to in urban spaces. So the intersection of you know climate change and human adaptation in urban spaces and what's being kind of thrown up in that is is less looked at by 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 thinkers in this this line of thought. Um, but another another writer whose work I really like, uh, Kian Go, uh, she she recently wrote uh, an article about this marking this 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 lack. And she sort of says, you know, um, if climate change is the defining challenge of the moment, how is it not indelibly transforming our core thinking of the urban? Um, so, you know, it seems to me that um, if we bring these two sort of questions and problem areas together, the 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 this, the seeming inevitability of the, the Anthropocene as an urban age, and then this, this idea of needing to think with um, the novel mutations of the 21st century. If we bring these two things together, um, I think that we might see that if we look at on the ground responses um, in cities, specific urban areas to uh, climate change, uh, things like rising seas and so on, we, we might see uh, uh, very different uh, spatial formations and spatial strategies emerging. Um, and the, these, you know, to kind of um, preview my, my ultimate argument from this talk, I think we might also see that some of these, these strategies and processes are actually um, pushing beyond the urban itself as a, or at least as we know it, pushing beyond the resilient city uh, as we know it as well. Um, and what I, what I have been marking in Miami is this move towards um, what I've been thinking about as an herbicidal Anthropocene. So that's, that's what I'll talk about. Um, for the rest of the time uh, that I have here today. Um, but so I, like I said, I've been taking up some of these questions um, through some research in Miami, Florida uh, over the last uh, several years. And you can see here, um, Miami is this very interesting urban area. It's this um, thin, super developed strip on the Southeast tip of Florida, you know, surrounded by <laughs> a vast ocean and uh, on one side, and then to the to the west, you have the Everglades. That's the dark space there. Um, it was Miami was um, you know uh, built on drained swampland. It's a heavily engineered, uh, heavily water engineered area, um, and it, it's a very interesting place to be looking at um, climate change responses, uh, partially because of its geography and its geology, um, uh, which I'll talk about in a little while but also um, because some of its socioeconomic uh, context. Uh, it was built, the city was entirely built really on real estate speculation and continues to be driven. Its, its development is, is driven um, by international real estate, uh, uh, which is actually considered key to the city's climate change responses. Um, historically, let me see here. Why is my slide not moving? There we go. Historically, um, the city, you know, has an image that's very well known uh, as being this sort of place of, you know, beaches and palm trees and sunshine and, and you know, the sort of uh, tourist vacation destination, this sort of subtropical paradise. Um, and, you know, this image has been really central to its real estate um, uh, uh, investment uh, over the years, and it's still very, very central to generating um, tourism and all that. It's a, it's one of the largest cruise ship ports uh, 
also in the country. Um, but it's what's very interesting, uh, you know, this this image is still uh, quite quite prominent and pushed, obviously. Um, but in recent years, there's been a, a shift in in Miami and Miami's image. Uh, and we're seeing like a new sort of set of iconic images. They're not um, the iconic palm tree per se, but the iconic palm tree surrounded by by salt water uh, flooding that we're we're seeing in Miami. So Miami has recently been sort of reproblematized uh, as climate change ground zero. We're seeing a, a lot of news articles. Um, uh, over the last several years, studies, um, design school reports, and so on, um, framing this as a, a sea rise hotspot in the United States. So it's um, it's uh, very, very low lying. The city is very low lying. It's built on forest um, limestone, which means that you get flooding from, from rising seas, not just, and, and from storms and heavy rain and so on, not just from the coast, as in some cities like New York, let's say, but also up through um, drainage uh, areas, sewers, and, and, and the ground. So this is a unique geological problem uh, for governing climate change um, because of this specific uh, conundrum. So we're, we're starting to see sunny day flooding uh, and saltwater flooding quite often in Miami, especially during periods of high tides, king tides. So this is not rainwater, this is um, water coming up through, uh, it's ocean water, salt water coming up through um, the gutters and that type of thing. So these kinds of images, these images of tourists walking through water in, in South Beach, or these images of, this is an octopus that was uh, found in a parking garage in Miami Beach, these uh, in, with the flooding, right? These are becoming uh, a new set of iconic images of Miami. And you know th they're an interesting uh, issue in their own right. Um, but they have also uh, led to Miami being sort of problematized as a living laboratory for, for climate change, for responding to sea rise, um, and a model for the world. Uh, this is how uh, a lot of um, resiliency institutes and planners and the government, city government, talk about Miami. Miami is uh, uh, an observatory for the world to watch in terms of cities facing climate change. What's happening in Miami is potentially what other cities will be facing down the line. It's not just that Miami is already experiencing flooding um, because of its geology and its, its uh, uh, low elevation, but also because um, sea rise is happening actually three times faster in the South Florida area. So it's actually getting a little bit faster rate of sea rise as well. So a test site for um, climate change adaptation, uh, urban climate change adaptation. Um, and I, I, I think that this reproblematizing of Miami itself is a really interesting, uh, Thing to look at, and, and I have been doing that, but um, what we're seeing is a whole set of uh, adaptive resiliency responses that attempt to sort of manage climate change to secure the city uh, from its effects. Um, and, you know, this is uh, in many ways due to the, the, you know, the specific socioeconomic landscape of Miami, which is, um, it's, like I said, it's a, a hyper-segregated real estate uh, uh, market it's a deliriously um, economically polarized city. Uh, it has some of the richest zip codes and some of the poorest zip codes in all of America. Um, and it's been ranked number one in terms of income inequality among US cities uh, for many years. It's, uh, you know, it's a place of celebrity mansions, tourism, uh, cruise ships, and it's also uh, considered the financial capital of Latin America, um, a place where you see, uh, you know, just condos being built on the edge of the water, um, with you know, twenty-five million dollar penthouses at the top. You know, just this kind of craziness. Um, it also has the world's highest value of uh, sort of real estate assets exposed to sea rise. So obviously, then you know, a, a really big issue as climate change has kind of come to the fore in Miami has been, you know, for for planners and, and governments there, you know, how to secure the city. From, from rising seas, you know, and how to maintain real estate markets, how to maintain tourism, how to maintain the image of Miami throughout all this, you know, uh, unscathed somehow. Um, so of course, there've been a lot of, you know, resiliency projects, uh, you know, infrastructure adaptations. So um, here in this image, what you see is uh, the former chief engineer of Miami Beach, Bruce Mowry, who was part of um, uh, this, this ongoing $500 million um, project called Miami Beach Rising Above, uh, which has been elevating some of the streets uh, throughout Miami Beach and installing pumps and uh, some new seawalls and this type of thing. 
Um, and you can see here, this is, you know, so he's, sit, he's standing in a restaurant um, that's now several feet below the, the streets. Um, and the goal eventually of this project is to elevate all the streets uh, a few feet in, in, at least in South Miami Beach um, and potentially all of Miami Beach to deal with flooding and that type of thing. Um, there are also, you know, these, these very interesting sort of nature as infrastructure projects to um, restore the Everglades and the natural hydraulic flows of the Everglades um, in hopes of pushing back saltwater intrusion into uh, the city's drinking water supply in the Biscayne Aquifer, which is, um, as I mentioned, that, that porous limestone underneath the surface of the city. There's the water runs through there, and the hope is to use the fresh water flows from the west of the Everglades to push back on the salt water flows coming in from the east, from the, from the coast. Um, because a lot of people think, you know, if, if um, the, the drinking water is contaminated, you won't have to even worry about flooding. That will be the real city killer in, in the, the more immediate future. Um, so that's a, that's a very interesting project too. You know, and there are all kinds of resiliency efforts like this, right? Um, you know, like New York, like other cities facing climate change, although Miami is having a more imminent version of that, uh, a more immediate version of that. Um, you know, the hope here is to use this sort of like recollage of different um, infrastructures, including, you know, social infrastructure, ecological infrastructure, technical infrastructure, and to bring these together into this assemblage that would be, you know, a resilient Miami, a resilient city. And this, you know, obviously is not a new uh, idea. The idea of the resilient city has, you know, an ungodly amount of, you know, practical uh, and critical literature surrounding it now. You know, we've seen the rise of resilience as a urban kind of um, paradigm since at least Sandy in New York uh, in 2012. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, I think, interesting how we often don't think beyond the resilient city. You know, we, you know, there's a lot of critique of it and there's still all this work to try to build it. And the hope at the heart of the resilient city is ultimately that it, you could bring these different infrastructures together and you could save the city, you know? So, you know, you could save the existing coastlines, you could save the existing formations, the building, the culture, you know, all of this. Um, of course, while transforming that culture because part of resilience is, you know, transforming people into social infrastructure that are always reactive and adaptive in this type of thing. In any case, the idea of resilience is that uh, the city can be saved despite climate change, despite all the, the effects of the Anthropocene. Um, you know, it's, it's the Rockefeller Foundation has this, this great phrase in a, in a film they did about resilience. They said, this is the, the, the age of resilience. There's no other way, right? Um, but what I think is really interesting in Miami is that it, uh, a lot of people think that there, there, there will be another way. Um, so in, in Miami, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, academics, scientists, planners, designers, even people in, in government, you know, publicly, of course, they talk about resilience and, and you know, building it and incremental adaptations that will just be added on throughout the 21st century, right? But if, if, you, if you talk candidly with them, and, and this is not necessarily not a public conversation, it's talked about all the time, most people think Miami is doomed, uh, right? So the, you, you see this, this uh, a lot of these images, these, these charts trying to visualize sea rise and its effects on Miami throughout the 21st century and up to 2100. And then of course, beyond 2100, um, which as you can see here, looks quite inundated. So um, Miami is expected to, based on you know, some of the projections, which are actually considered potentially low by some scientists in Miami, um, by 2040, 10 to 17 inches of sea rise, by 2070, two to 54 inches of sea rise, and by uh, 2120, 40 to 136 inches. Um, so the resiliency infrastructures that we see in Miami Beach, for example, these elevations, they're just designed for the next like 30 or 40 years. Um, and you know, it's an interesting thing to, to think about also that with COVID, um, there's been a, you know, obviously like so many cities, a big loss of um, revenue for municipal governments in Miami. Uh, and it's, it will be interesting to see if funding you know, what happens with funding for resiliency projects like even these or future ones, um, given the drop in tourism, you know, Miami's just desperately dependent on tourism and that kind of thing. It'll be interesting to see how that, that affects those. But in any case, um, when you talk to a lot of planners and scientists, the, the word is doomed. People say Miami's doomed. It's really unlikely. Um, 
the Tom Gustafson is someone uh, I'll talk about quite a bit in the rest of this talk. He's the former speaker of the Florida House of Representatives uh, and the former director of the Institute of Environment at, at Florida International University. He he's, has said, you know, given the, our elevations in, in South Florida, the greenhouse gas is already in the atmosphere, the likely acceleration of greenhouse gas emissions in the next couple of decades, and then sea rise feedback mechanisms. There's little likelihood that by 2100, uh, South Florida will be uh, habitable. You know, and again, this is a lot, a lot of these forecasts had to do with the geology, right? So in, in New York, you could build, maybe, right? The idea at least is that you could build the Ark Ingalls, you know, seawalls around Manhattan. You could build, you know, big barriers, that type of thing. But in Miami, seawalls don't really work because the water comes up from the foundation. So you really have no means of just blocking it out like that. Um, you can't, you know, fill them with styrofoam. <laughs> like, like, you can't do that. So, so then the, it's really hard um, and there are no visions really for how uh, you could preserve the existing city. So, um, so when you talk, you know, one of, when, when you talk to planners and you talk to scientists at Florida International University who are involved in the Sea Level Solutions Center, when you talk to um, designers in Miami, uh, there is a proposal that comes up often about, well, what do we do? How would the South Florida area be habitable by 2100? And what you hear often is that the only way this region will be habitable is if we make, if we turn Miami into a series of elevated islands um, with uh, high rise buildings and you know, new elevated bridges and uh, roadways and this type of thing. Um, I have been very interested in this proposal and uh, I have talked uh, quite a bit with Tom Gustafson, again, the, the uh, former speaker of the Florida House of Representatives, who is the biggest proponent of this proposal. Um, he's done some presentations on it. He has just this mountain of, of literature on it and he, uh, he believes it's the only way uh, to do it. So here's how he envisions uh, this working out. He, um, ha. He, uh, he thinks that the government needs to obtain 100% of the city's developed land to use as fill. Uh, so, so the idea is not just to elevate the existing Miami, right? It's to destroy the existing Miami, obtain all the land, condemn it, buy it out, uh, you know, and then sell it to private developers and then buy it out from them. Whatever it takes, he, he believes that all the land needs to be converted into fill. So, you know, um, clearing the, the built materials, the earthen materials, you know, maybe uh, removing the palm trees, removing the historic Art Deco hotels, um, demolishing them, maybe preserving them, you know, using excavators to, to move the sand. Um, and you can see here in this image, this is, uh, you know, the ongoing sand beach renourishment that's happening all the time in Miami. Um, you always see these trucks out on the beach uh, because all the sand that's there, all the beach is actually artificially made. The whole, the whole, the whole place is artificially made. It was built um, as real estate speculation in the, in the early 20th century, so very, very recently. Um, and, and the sand always has to be restocked and all this. Um, but I like this image too, because it kind of, there, there, there isn't a visual for the South Florida Islands, which is Tom Gustafson's name for this, this uh, proposal for Miami. Um, but it, it's interesting to, to think about it looking at this, right? So the idea is not just to, to move around sand or move around buildings or elevate existing streets, but to actually scrap the whole city and use that as fill you know, because there's a shortage of sand and the shortage of a lot of these materials uh, worldwide. Use that as fill to create this whole new territory of, of islands. Um, uh, as he describes it, the islands would be, would contain sort of luxury high-rise buildings uh, with residential space for service sector workforce. Uh, the rest of the population would have to be migrated out via managed retreat of some kind or another. Um, but a, a key component of his vision is the idea that um, the, the islands would have fully localized um, food, materials, and energy production. Um, so it would be, as he describes it, a regional refuge uh, where production is done by residents themselves or uh, by a tabletop design, uh, manufacturing, tabletop manufacturing. Um, they would have storm resistant architecture to withstand sort of the intense rains and storms and hurricanes that are expected in the region that already happened in the region. Um, wind and solar technologies, uh, and as he calls it, an electronic library of the Alexander and seed bank of crops suited to the region's long-term climate change future. So I think this proposal is very interesting. Um, it, it, 
first, first of all, I think that it is interesting because it's sort of a model of adaptation, a strategy of adaptation that is not resilience. It's not urban resilience. The idea is that the city cannot be resilient in this vision. It's doomed, it's gonna be flooded, it's a failure. So there's this very new formation, Miami built on real estate speculation, you know, scrap it. So this is not resilience, it's sort of like a stage two kind of adaptation. We might think it's like, okay, resilience has failed. What else, what else can be done? You know, resilience is about sort of remodulating the existing geography, the existing urban space, sea walls, elevated roads, you know, pumps to move out the water, right? This type of thing oyster reefs around the, the coasts of cities, you know, this type of model. But that is all about, you know, preserving the existing city by, by new definitions of infrastructure and so on. But here, this is sort of imagining that that's not possible. So, you know, rather than this age of sort of endless urban resilience, this is sort of like a, an herbicidal Anthropocene vision, uh, as I've been thinking about it. Um, an herbicide, you know, usually is this term used by, by people like Stephen Graham, Marshall Berman, to describe, you know, different ways of sort of killing cities or intentionally ending cities. Um, you know, Stephen Graham talks about it a lot in terms of, you know, American military campaigns in Iraq or the IDF uh, in Palestinian camps, the bulldozing of camps in urban districts. Um, and in, in counterinsurgency work, herbicide is often described as sort of the strategy where you, you attack the insurgents' uh, uh, urban foundations, right? So this idea that critical infrastructure you know, uh, government facilities and so on. These are the um, sort of ground on which, you know, insurgent forces grow and so they have to be attacked, right? Um, and, you know, in Marshall Berman's work and others, you know, herbicide's been used to, to, to think about the sort of deliberate neoliberal sort of um, bulldozing of, you know, slums or evicting, um, you know, uh, urban residents and building, you know, stadiums in their place and this type of thing, right? Um, but this is, a, I think this is a little bit different kind of way of thinking about herbicide. It's sort of like an Anthropocene herbicide in, this, in a couple of different senses. Um, on the one hand, you know, when we think about the urban foundations, the urban ground here in Miami, it, it, it's sort of being taken as a different kind of problem. It's, it's considered you know, a pragmatic and actually an existential problem. The ground itself is the cause of Miami's, you know, perceived vulnerability the, to sea rise. Um, and it's also seen as a solution, right? If you if you grind it up and bulldoze it, you can use it as fill to make a new urban space, right? Um, so this is a vision of herbicide that is specific to these Anthropocene kind of issues uh, that would involve, you know, taking all this, you know, pretty artificially created urban space and just, you know, kind of grinding it up and building a, a, a new space, you know, and in some sense, it's like in Miami, because the city is so artificial, because it was so recently built, perhaps maybe this seems more imaginable there. I, uh, you know, it seems, you know, it's been done before, I would do it again, you know, just, just pack it up, start over. Um, it would be a kind of a fitting destiny for the city in some sense. Um, so I've been trying to think about this, this strategy of, you know, this sort of herbicidal strategy uh, and the sort of resulting envisioned spatial form uh, this idea of the South Florida islands, you know, uh, and I've been trying to think about how these can be understood, you know, with work on planetary urbanization. How do they relate to the idea of planetary urbanization or not? Um, so, you know, one way we could think about uh, the South Florida islands would be is like, okay, this is another sort of, you know, another novel, but yet another, uh, you know, sort of spatial urban form you know, generated in response to environmental transformation, um, a kind of, you know, uh, extension of the planetary urbanization uh, concept. You know, here it would be another example of a sort of like endless dialectic of um, planetary urbanization and creative destruction, you know, like kind of a Marxist perspective. This is a, you know, as Andy Merrifield puts it, a kind of neo um, that you know, which in the Anthropocene would just continue infinitely, uh, constantly. Um, you know, dismantling city, creating island spaces and so on and so forth. Um, and I think that's totally one way to think about this. Um, if not wrong, uh, it, it, it makes sense. Um, although the, the, the extent to which this would be a process driven solely by uh, capital, capital lo the logic of capital accumulation and, and all of that is, is you know, maybe uh, debatable. Um, obviously there would be 
in the in the small snippet of the vision of the vision for the islands that I have said uh, described here for you already, there's clearly uh, you know great opportunity for an economic uh, gain and investment and all of that, right? There's definitely you know clearing out the undesirable populations. So it's definitely that, right? Um, but it's also this sort of existential response to the to the the doomed nature of the city, the impossibility of resilience. So there's a little something. You know, different there. It's not just uh, comprehensible as a economic uh, driver. Um, but I, but I'm, I think what's a little bit more interesting is thinking about how this 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 vision of this uh, you know island uh, and the process of building it relates to planetary urbanization um, in a negative way. So uh, I think that there's another sort of herbicidal form, herbicidal strategy that we hear we see in this vision that's not just about um, destroying the existing Miami, you know, that existing city, it's this, this you know, uh, container of space and so on. But an herbicide that's about cutting the links that actually define planetary urbanization um, in a lot of uh, work on this idea. So, so planetary urbanization, so much of it is about this idea of this uh, earthwide integration of infrastructural networks, you know, the bringing of really distant spaces of extraction, um, production, you know, into connection with each other to service urban spaces, right? Operationalizing everything, the oceans, the hinterlands, whatever, to extract resources, populations, um, energy, and so on to, to then fuel these certain spaces, right? Um, so it's a, it's, it's a concept of interconnection, right? Um, of infrastructural interconnection. Uh, and this is why, you know, a lot of scholars working in that, in that framework want to move away from the bounded city idea, right? Um, because the city is unbounded by this planetary condition, uh, right? And and that's obviously the case, and we see that everywhere, right? We we this is a great description of the present. But um, what I think is interesting is the way in which um, in the South Florida Islands vision, the the a key component is cutting those infrastructural links. So switching cities off, cutting those links, um, is is integral to it, and relocalizing uh, production energy uh, wise, food wise, you know, materials wise, so on to, to the island uh, is interesting to me. So it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of spatial strategy, I think that, that emerges, you know, it's not a return to the bounded city in the sense of it's not going back to something. You know, it's just not about what planetary urbanization doesn't, you know, include or something like that or what it, what it elides, you know. It's about a, a specific strategic response to uh, this unique historical moment in the third decade of the of the 21st century, in response to the perceived uh, you know problems of this in infrastructural inter interconnection, it's it's it, you know for Gustafsson he he said I I did an interview with him in March 2020, which was like the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, and he was like, listen, you see coronavirus, we have to cut all some global supply chains, the chains, the future requires isolationism, you know. And this is not a unique perspective at all. Yeah, I think this islandization trend, uh, whether we mean actual islands, like I'm talking about with the South Florida Islands vision here, or you know, islands as a sort of metaphor for you know, you know, luxury bunkers, this type of thing. You know, this this trend is 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 growing. It's uh, as people see the you know this, this the, the the disasters caused by infrastructural connection the vulnerabilities but also the you know there's also a different version of this that, that sees these interconnections as a uh, you know um, political mode of control of populations uh, you know this is a really great uh, part of uh, architect Ross Exo Adams work on urbanization, you know, he's, he, he argues, you know, urbanization, this linking of, of everything and everyone into this continuous uh, system of flows, you know, is primarily, first and foremost, uh, a, a political technology of, of governance, right, and of control. So perceiving all these problems with this global interconnection, uh, not to mention its lack of sustainability and so on, which Tom Gustafson, the, the, the proponent of South Florida Islands, also agrees with, you know, um, you know the fact that th these this this global uh, system is actually causing the Anthropocene, right? So for all these different reasons, islandization, it, you know, the attempt to to cut with infrastructural linkages is, I think, uh, becoming quite quite a bit more common as a means of sort of um, surviving the 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 Anthropocene and potentially mitigating it um, and potentially building some kind of you know sovereignty within it for for some for some people. Um, 
so of course, you know, uh, so, you know, urban ecological security zones are, are pretty common. Uh, in, you know, this critique of this kind of approach is pretty common. You know, we have a lot of work in geography and urban studies. Um, although usually, you know, um, work like Simon Marvin and Mike Hodson's on urban ecological security is usually about this attempt to sort of, um, you know, re rebound, you know, and, and, and contain and then secure existing cities like London or something like this. We don't, we haven't seen as much this um, work on potentially creating a new island space, right? You know, and of course it, it, it would be, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of darkness to this vision. You can imagine this is a super exclusive, super elite kind of South Florida islands where, you know, there's a service sector that will service the, the very rich who live in the $35 million penthouses on the island. And, you know, uh, we, we see a lot of, um, a lot of prefigurations of this approach in Miami already. Um, I was just talking to my friend, Jean Marino, uh, who is a, a curator at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Miami. And he was like, you know, Fisher Island is like, you know, the early version of this. Um, Fisher Island is a small island uh, off of Miami Beach that you can only ac access um, by uh, a helicopter or a private boat. Um, there's no roads, none of that. Uh, and it has uh, checkpoints and everything. Um, and it's it's a really interesting uh, place, you know. I think it's it was rated by one of those Bloomberg studies as the the richest zip code in America. Uh, the average income is 2.5 million. Uh, you know, the people like Oprah have houses there. This this type of place. And and recently, um, they have a special contract with um, the University of Miami healthcare system. They have their own clinic on the island and this type of thing. And they were you know early on back when you know. People like people like me in you know April of 2020, where you know, wanted to get a coronavirus test. I was sick, you know, and you couldn't get one unless you had been to Italy, you know, which was completely crazy at that time because it was coronavirus was everywhere. You know, nobody could get a test no matter how sick they were. You know, it was crazy. But this island had like all the they bought tests for all their residents and the staff, right? And so everyone was tested, and then they got antibody tests, and then they got now now they have vaccines, you know, all this type of thing. So it's kind of this little bunker island, you know, vision. And certainly the South Florida Islands might be that as well uh, if it were to be built, right? Um, you know, and, and I think that it's very likely, you know, this is a trend of the future of islandization of the, you know, the very rich, you know, this type of thing, but in actual islands to deal with uh, the environmental uh, factors in a region like South Florida. There's also um, a startup firm there called ARCA in it's uh, working in Miami building um, floating yachts and floating eco villages and they're very beautiful, like super nice design, super expensive, you know, this type of thing. Um, you know, but I, I have to say that, you know, just in terms of what is opened up for thought by this idea of the South Florida Islands, I, I, do, I do think, you know, that there are compelling aspects of this vision. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up with, with this thought, but, um, you know, we, you know, Tom Gustafson, again, the proponent of this vision, he's often, you know, if you talk to some of the serious resilience planners, they agree that, that you know, there's really no other way, but they also kind of like will laugh at his vision. You know, it's so crazy. It's so audacious, right? It's so, you know, is it childish to imagine something so insane, right? Something with such upheaval, it's unthinkable, right? But in some ways, you know, I wonder, you know, there's something compelling about that willingness to envision something so crazy. You know, it seems to me that the Anthropocene only calls for that, right? That's like exactly what the Anthropocene calls for. You know, these, these really uh, wild, experimental, actually super transformative visions. Obviously, his tends in a potentially dark direction, but not necessarily, you know, we, we'd have to find out in practice. Um, you know, and, and especially given the way that urban resilience is, is extremely conservative and, and, you know, often geared towards, you know, not rocking the boat too much, you know, designs that will sit, you know, happily with the, you know, the, the millionaires living on Miami Beach, you know, it's you know, ultimately about preserving existing, you know, systems, you know, there's something I have to say, I think, you know, uh, you know, compelling at least in, in, you know, the willingness to envision just sort of like bulldozing this, the, the world's or the country's most unequal city, you know, these, these $25 million penthouses, um, you know, the Trump Towers that line part of the beach here, you know, and trying something different. Um, you know, it, it's uh, design 
in the Anthropocene is often being put towards governance and, and preserving existing systems, even though a lot of designers really want something more than that. And it, there's a feeling of like grant money and all that, they're kind of trapped in this paradigm. Um, but there's an interesting, you know, it, it, this, this vision raises an interesting idea that design might actually be something that could be put towards other ends, actually, um, in some sense, more negative ends in the sense of uh, dismantling, uh, you know, obsolete spaces, uh, destructive practices and strategies and so on. And that could actually be a very hubristic project for the Anthropocene too. It's interesting to me, you know, the stopping these kinds of projects is usually, um, you know, stopping infrastructures or, 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 or dismantling systems is typically thought of as this sort of, you know, a, a revolutionary upheaval moment type of practice, right? Or a social movement type practice. But here we could imagine it as also a design practice that is taken up at a, at a widespread scale. At least it suggests that to me. And that, that, that is interesting, I think. Um, I was recently in, in, in touch with some, some researchers and in, in engineers in France uh, at the school, ESC Clermont uh, Business School. And they're actually doing an Anthropocene uh, strategy and design program for students to, to try to uh, de-presence, as they put it, de-presence or de-world already obsolete technologies. Um, and I, I think this is a very compelling uh, project. Um, in any case, at the end of the day, the, the question really isn't, you know, is this a, a good or bad project or kind of judging it because, you know, all these types of things um, can only be understood if they were to be created in reality and, and how that would play out, you know? Um, but I think it brings up just con allowing this, this, this vision of, of Miami's future to suspend for a moment our sort of assumptions about the Anthropocene as an inherently urban age of just like never ending resilience infrastructures and remodulations and ever expanding planetary urbanization. It allows us to sort of suspend that for a second and think that there might be other possibilities uh, you know, and other strategies for approaching the Anthropocene I think that that itself is a valuable thing uh, to, to sit in that space for a, for a minute and, and consider, um, you know, uh, that, you know, what it, what it suggests to me in terms of urban theory is that, um, you know, potentially even the, 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 the new spatial categories that we inherit with, from planetary urbanization work might themselves be uh, superseded and potentially are already being superseded by climate change and responses to it. So for urban thinking, I think is, is very, very important to, to be open to that possibility and to, to examine it. So I'll stop there. I've talked a bit too long. Thanks everybody. Thanks so much, Steph. That was a uh, fantastic as, as always, uh, kind of a lot of thought provoking. I've scribbled loads of, of uh, notes. Maybe I just, um, I got a couple of questions here. Um, maybe I'll just kind of start off with one and then, um, uh, we can kind of move to those, or actually a comment rather than a question. I mean, I'm, I'm very compelled to this idea of kind of herbicide as planning in a sense of like stage one of this kind of, you know, killing the city to remake it anew. And, you know, you were kind of making that move from Stephen Graham's a kind of herbicide as this kind of like military kind of um, city killing. But actually, even if we think of, you know, post-war Germany, for example, where, where okay, the program wasn't to that's the ally bombing, allies bombing flattened German cities so that they can be rebuilt. There was no idea of them being rebuilt afterwards and in that process of destruction. But that was a massive gift to, of course, the designers and urban planners who got this kind of killed herbicidal space through which they could reimagine the future of the city and the future of life in a way that they had been wanting to in the 20s and 30s but couldn't implement. There's quite a lot of interesting discussion. It would almost be interesting to place this vision as, as you have it, which is a very kind of in some ways a kind of paradigm shift in kind of how to think about beyond the resilient city in a kind of longer history of herbicide as planning or planning post city death whatever but I, i'll move to the, the the questions here so the first one comes from uh, mika Roo and says uh hi stephanie when considering demolition and rebuild of an urban environment like miami because of sea level rise etc why then rebuild in the same place this geographic region will not only be compromised by sea level rise also increase uh, elevated humidity, hurricane, et cetera, will make life there unpleasant. Wouldn't it be better to move populations elsewhere? 
And I'll just include the second question as well here from uh, Dee Tuberty, I'm not sure the, the first name. I've uh, really enjoyed the talk. As was mentioned towards the end, one important critical take on the future of cities suggests the development of enclaves, like Simon Marvin's idea of infrastructural enclaves, securitized spaces, but which retain connections to global infrastructure networks rather than being cut off. Related to that, do you think there's a possible risk of taking the idea of relocalizing or decentralizing infrastructure production too seriously? This is an attractive image, which is a long history in sustainable cities thinking, but seems to often be more misleading than rail. Um, of another question from Iris, but we'll come back to that maybe if you want to take those two. Sure, sure. Uh, thanks, Rory, and, and thanks everybody for the questions here. Um, they're super good questions. So, well, in terms of the first one of uh, why uh, rebuild in the same place, um, well, I think part of it is the the mystique of the place, the the allure of the place. You know, Miami is a, and South Florida, this is this area that has this incredible appeal for designers, for tourists, for you know, people to live there, uh, you know, it has a, a real draw. And I think that, you know, part of the, the vision is, you know, how do you continue life in that area, you know? So this, like, like where you're saying, this could be like a, an incredible opportunity, quote unquote, for, for designers and planners, right? To like reimagine that whole area, you know, and to do this huge, you know, redesign projects, you know, and all that, um, you know, and investment wise, that makes sense too. You know, one interesting thing that, that uh, Tom Gustafson had mentioned to me in interviews was like, well, we, it's also a very um, fortunate place to be, uh, you know, we're at the, 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 the southern tip of the US, right, a southeastern tip of the US. Um, and to get funding for the project, he, he says that the, the, the way to go would be to propose it as having um, a, a bunch of islands, right, connected by these bridges. Um, and have some of them serve as uh, uh, U.S. Uh, military bases that would be a, a first rampart against the, the pirates of the Caribbean that he believes will be um, uh, attacking the U.S. with the failure of some island states uh, in the future due to climate change. So you can really see the direction that this would go if you think about that little uh, piece of the vision, right? Um, so he's like, they, wouldn't the U.S. government rather have those bases down in the South Florida Islands than in, let's say, South Carolina or somewhere? Yeah, so it's a, a, a strategic location in that sense as well. Um, but ultimately, you know, there's another piece of his vision, which is that this is designed only to last up until 2100. So after that, you know, this is a guy who really believes in uh, catastrophic climate change. You know, really, he really sees the future as being the collapse of civilizations and just like horrific sea rise and all of that. Um, he takes that very seriously. And so for him, he's like, then the question that 2100 becomes, how do you pack up uh, a civilization of a few million people with modern technology and move them, make them mobile and able to go somewhere else around the, the planet? <laughs> that's, that's his idea. So this is a temporary idea, not meant to last much longer than Miami itself. Um, so, okay, then, then about the, the enclaves. Yeah, so totally. I, I agree. I mean, the, the one way to read this kind of vision and the islandization trend in general that I think we're seeing you know, with the seasteads, you know, the floating yacht communities and all that is, of course, this extension of this, you know, what, what Marvin talks about is uh, these infrastructural enclaves, these securitized spaces, of course, that then would also have like, you know, they would cut certain ties, certain infrastructural ties, but maintain others. So, you know, um, communications you know, internet, you know, this type of connectivity is not necessarily going away, right? So of course, yeah, I mean, I think that that's definitely the tra one of the trajectories that, that we see in this. And this is just um, an interesting version of it that takes an island formation uh, specifically, um, rather than the island as a metaphor for the city, right? Uh, you know, the island as a real in, you know, transitional spatial form that we're seeing. Um, yeah, and in terms of the, I, I'm not sure that I understand fully what you mean by, do you think there's a chance of taking too seriously the infrastructural uh, de decentralization? Right. Um, well, I mean, it might be worth taking seriously. It might be, I, I think it, it's a, it's a, the, the idea of doing that is, is one that a lot of people around the world and from very different perspectives are trying to, you know, to, to varying degrees of success, it's much harder, right? And this is part of the reason why it's so hard to actually, you know, transform certain existing uh, structures because of these infrastructural connections that, and ties and dependencies that exist, right? I mean, but it is interesting, you, you said it's, a, it's an attractive image with a long history in sustainable cities thinking, that's true. And it's been, it's been very interesting to see how the sustainable cities thinking has really gone by the wayside uh, in the last decade 
is supplanted by resilience. I was reading Simon uh, Marvin's work around you know 2010 about this. I was reading it again right now. You know, looking back on everything that's happened since 2010 when some of that work came out, and you know, at that time people were really talking a lot more about how the sustainable city stuff was potentially going to dovetail with um, some of this uh, enclave city stuff, right? Uh, but it's been really interesting how resilience has kind of Displace some of those elements over the last decade, and we don't hear as much about that. Resilience is much more about, you know, how do we just allow the existing infrastructural connections, but like secure them to to disorder, right? And how do we continue the destructive practices rather than make more sustainable ones, but shore up cities amidst that? Um, Iris Muller was going to, to come in there, but she said you kind of just answered uh, the question more or less, but. Um, which kind of points then to kind of, you know, resilience being one kind of model, a resilient city, the second being this kind of Miami solution, as she's called it here, and then the third being the, the moving people option. Is there not discussion of this or why, why is the kind of mass moving? And obviously in the Miami solution, you'd have to move people and then there might be a question of what, what people come back. Um, I just want to take a question then from Keanu Callahan. Callahan sorry. Um, thanks for the talk. Two questions. First, on linking of Misha and Iris, how important is the city uh, imaginary of Miami in the choice to rebuild and how do you think this links to critiques of established spatial categories and planetary urbanization and the second uh, the discussion on backfill is very interesting you may be familiar with RJ Koselniak's work on Detroit I am not he has been looking at the political economy ecology of this industry itself relation to the demolition of vacant buildings how important is this uh, in Miami and is there similar things going on there that's a super, super interesting question. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so the, first, the first question about um, the city imaginary of Miami uh, and how important is that in the choice to rebuild and how do you think this links to critiques of established spatial categories and planetary urbanization, right? Um, yeah, I mean, so this, this book that I'm just finishing now about, about Miami and the city of Anthropocene and stuff, it, it, it's, you know, almost unintentionally a huge portion of it is about urban imaginary in Miami because this, the city is almost purely spectacle in some sense. You know, it is a city of imagination, of, of visuals, you know, of aesthetics, um, and it's been and it's it's very interesting to watch how that 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 imaginary is changing. You know, and how even climate change there, you know, this idea that it's like sea rise, ground zero, even that has kind of in some ways been glamorous for Miami, you know, attractive in that way that the apocalyptic is attractive, you know, the city on the edge, you know, the first one that will go, you know, be there to see history, you know, that kind of thing. In some ways, I think that is actually adding, not detracting from Miami's uh, uh, sexiness, which is which is interesting, right? Um, and so, and, and, and it's brought in just a, an unbelievable number of outside institutions to kind of tackle the problem of Miami, right? So you have a bunch of the Harvard graduate school, uh, design graduate school, you know, seminars taking Miami as their object and, you know, designing, you know, potential solutions to the, the problems. And some of these are really interesting, to be honest. And, you know, there's outside development um, consultants coming in and running, you know, scenario games to, um, to try to, uh, you know, figure out solutions and all this. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's proven to be very attractive. Um, and, and part of that is that it's it's such a, a city of imagination and, and and aesthetics that it's almost you know it's almost like a design uh, you know project itself you know it, it is almost um, an architectural rendering become real right and so it's somehow really easy to be able to take that on and just elevate it or demolish it and then build something new with it you know it's 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 somehow it's really amenable to that it doesn't have all the old buildings of New York City it doesn't have you know uh, all that type of history. But of course, it, this area does have a lot of history. You know, you have the Miccosukee uh, people living in the Everglades and in Miami and in South Florida with their own very, very different interpretation of what's happening and, you know, plans for the future and all that. Um, anyways, let me not talk forever about this one question, but uh, in terms of how this relates to the, the, the critiques of established spatial categories and planetary urbanization work, um, you know, I think on the one hand, you can see that there are some interesting new spatial formations emerging in the resilience project. So the, the elevated city, you know, the elevated roadways, it's a different landscape, you know, the Everglades is infrastructure, a stack, an infrastructural stack now brought into the city 
these, the, the idea of the gravity of the, and the weight of the Everglades flow is pushing on saltwater. And then this Anthropocene marine transgression moving in. And then this, this dynamic as an infrastructure to, to preserve drinking water. You know, these are interesting new urban spaces. But I also think this idea that, you know, you might actually demolish the existing urban space, you know, that it might not be resilient and it might not be there. This is an interesting, uh, you know, way of moving beyond established spatial categories in practice, right? Um, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with this, this work that you mentioned, so I, I'm going to check it out. Thank you. Um, I'm just conscious of the time where we're coming up to um, two minutes to two, and I, I know some people will need to, to leave for teaching and so on, but there's a couple of questions um, coming in, and I'll read those to you, Stephanie, and then we can run on a few minutes later, but maybe we wind up at about, at about five past two for those who are able to um, stay on, and of course the recording will be, be available in due course. So from Anna Davis from here in Trinity, uh, it says, great talk, Stephanie, thank you. Do you see any resonance with your research on the concept of multi-layered, multi-scalar risk scapes related to climate change? Underpinning this is a complex calculative mechanism which are selectively used by decision makers, for example, how they see them as being pragmatic, feasible, financiable. And there's a special issue which she points to in the link uh, to the Cambridge Journal of Regions, Economy and Societies on this. Um, and then I'll just take the last question then from uh, John Poog. Um, okay, trying to think through wider implications of this way of thinking with islands. The island is of course the opposite of how Steph articulates in wider Anthropocene debate, where islands are key sites for registering relational entanglements for developments of resilience, registering ongoing legacies of colonialism and modernity, the canaries in the coal mine, etc. So I was wondering how Stephanie's islands of disentanglement rather than relational entanglement might play into the hubris of older post-colonial island struggles around the world. Um, and a couple of thanks from Martin and Kian. So um, I guess the, the multi-layered, multi-scalar risk scapes, and then this kind of idea of how islands in Anthropocene discourse are relational entanglements as opposed to this kind of disentanglement of like, non-relational um, island building perhaps. Um, okay, sure, sure, thanks. Um, thanks, uh, Anna and John for these. Um, yeah, so the, the, this idea of a risk scape uh, is, is, is being increasingly used uh, in grants and planning and government to describe the South Florida region. Because it's not right. It's not just um, uh, sea rise and flooding. It's also extreme heat. Uh, it's it's actually quite unbearable. A lot of the times of the year, you have a lot of um, people without air conditioning. You have uh, you know heat uh, 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 disease. You know it's it's proven kind of a hot spot actually for COVID nineteen. Um, uh, you had Zika. You know uh, it's so talking about and, you know, the drinking water issues. We have a uh, massive water pollution problems there too. So this idea of a risk scape has been part, a, a, a key part of sort of uh, reimagining Miami. So you have this, this, this like this, these charts that, that, you know, instead of, you know, tourist postcards, it's nothing but this sort of like layered elements of risk. And then how do you, where can you intervene becomes the, the question and how, you know, how feasible is that, right? So, so some of the, you know, people who are planners behind the South, uh, the Sea Level Solution Center and the South Florida Water Management District um, they talk about this in terms of incremental adaptation. So rather than big hubristic, you know, gigantic projects all at once, they, they think that we need to be more measured and more realistic and we're in a situation of deep uncertainty. So what we need to do, they think is sort of, you know, build in the ability to add incremental little adaptations over time that will over time somehow just work out well, right? So there's some, let's say like there's a one pump they installed in Miami Beach, but there's three spaces. So as you know, things get worse, add another pump. This is kind of how they think about, about that there. Um, you know, so it's a very measured approach in contrast to these big, big approaches. Um, yeah, and so, so then John, John's question about Anthropocene islands and, and yeah, and, and John has been doing super interesting work about islands in the Anthropocene. Um, and yeah, and I, uh, I, I, the way I, I see islands here as this islandization, islandization process really does seem to me to be um, in contrast to the way that it seems a lot of like Anthropocene thinking is talking about islands. So, so like John said, you, you see a lot of this work describing islands as sort of this, these emblems for like relational entanglements, which are, you know, so often described as the, the necessary and only way uh, to live in the Anthropocene, right, more broadly. So, you know, we see all this work about, you know, the Anthropocene at the time of relational entanglement, uh, we need to learn to live in these entanglements and, and so on, right? Um, and I think 
islandization, if we were to like step back a little bit from the specific example of South Florida and Miami and cities and all that, if we step back and think about islandization uh, more broadly, I think that we, 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 we are also seeing, you know, people in different, you know, very different perspectives and with very different motivations trying to detach from these relational entanglements because they perceive them as oppressive or, you know, um, modes of governing or, or simply as a source of risk, you know, right, uh, you know, to, you know, vulnerable to disasters or, you know, supply chain disruptions, this type of thing. But also, again, modes of governing, right? So, so there are also sovereignty movements and autonomy movements that are that are really, you know, trying to detach and gain some control over their life, right? So, islandization, I think, has a lot of very variations and different, you know, uh, inflections uh, that could go in many different directions. But I do think, you know, it is and will be an increasingly common response to relational entanglement, you know. And then I think what's Again, another thing that's compelling about it is that, it, it, you know, islandization kind of is an attempt to say that maybe there are other ways of living in the Anthropocene besides this hegemonic idea of relational entanglement, right? That maybe we could disentangle um, and that could be a, a, a liberatory process potentially as well. So, so John, you're asking about um, post-colonial struggles too. I mean, it, we might, you know, it might be an interesting way of thinking about what, um, you know, uh, you know, liberatory struggles look like in, in this day and age in the Anthropocene. Of course, there are a lot of limitations and challenges to that too, and, and how it's done and who and, and by whom and why and to what, you know, these are all questions that have to be asked, right? Okay, so I think we will uh, have to wind it up given the, given the time, but Stephanie, thanks so much. That was really uh, fascinating. I think the amount uh, of questions and uh, um, has been assigned to that and I, I think really great particularly in this context in, in our department where there's a lot of concentration on our urban geography and particularly also kind of coastal um, relation kind of uh, across kind of physical and human uh, geography so that's been really really fantastic thank you so much uh, for that and thanks everyone for the questions um, sorry to have missed uh, Kathleen's question but we can we can come back to that uh, and there's lots of thanks coming in there on the chat but I will wind up the recording now um, just to say thanks again to, to Stephanie and for everyone for attending. Thanks, Rory, and thanks everybody for taking time to, to come today. I really appreciate it. Thanks all.